Hi, my name is Scott Benson. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Family and Preventive Medicine here at the University of Utah. I'm an infectious disease doc and I specialize in global health and tropical diseases. I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about COVID-19 impacts and sex and gender differences. Now, by way of disclaimer, our understanding of COVID-19 right now is still relatively fresh and new. And the things that I talk about today are to the best of our knowledge. And they may and probably will be changing a little bit over the next few years. So as we learn more, some of the things that we talk about today may be disproven or really go out of date. I also want to recognize that sex and gender describe different, char different characteristics. For the purposes of this discussion, we're going to talk about sex in the biological sense of male and female. And while I recognize that there is a spectrum of gender identities, at this point in the literature, there is not enough information to really provide information on gender differences across the spectrum in response to COVID-19. So with that caveat, let's begin. First, I'd like to talk about how the infection occurs. COVID-19 utilizes a couple of mechanisms to infect the, the, the human cell, typically the epithelial cell. The most important components are the ACE2 receptor and a protein called the transmembrane protein receptor for serine 2, or TMPRSS2. Those two receptors combine and allow the COVID-19 virus, or SARS-CoV-2, to invade into the human cell, typically an epithelial cell, and begin replication, thereby causing infection. Now, while there are other players that are important in this activity, like trypsin and other proteases, the primary two that we are most concerned about at this point are the ACE2 receptor and TMPRSS2, or the serine receptor number two. So what then becomes important is where in the body are these two receptors, or the receptor and the protease, located? Uh, they are, as you can see in this description, this figure here, really they are found throughout the body. One of the things that we've recognized over the course of the past year as we've learned more about COVID is that it, while we've considered it a pulmonary or respiratory disease, it's much more of a vascular disease and it can attack the endothelial walls of tissue anywhere. It's just that we first recognized it in the, the pulmonary tissue because it is so vascular. But really anywhere that there's an epithelial layer, COVID can attack. You can see here that almost all tissues, and now with the past year's worth of history, we've seen almost all tissues impacted through the literature at one degree or another. Now, there are a few interesting caveats. You'll notice that a lot of the immunogenic tissues, bone marrow, spleen, lymph nodes, we have not well described finding uh, ACE2 receptors in those tissues. Similarly, the testes, the male testes, it's been contradictory. There have been some studies that have found ACE2 receptors and others who have failed to find it. So there are still a lot of areas that we don't quite understand the, the distribution of ACE2 receptors and uh, the serine receptors throughout the body. Now, what that tells us, though, is that in areas where those receptors are, the infection can occur and impact the pathophysiology of the patient. Over the course of this, this pandemic, we really learned a lot. In March of 2020, when I was giving discussions about uh, COVID-19, these are the numbers that I cited. In Italy, the male-female uh, coronavirus cases and deaths were predominantly men, 60% of coronavirus cases, 70% of deaths at that time were male over female. In China, the initial reports were that 64% of deaths were in men. Now, originally, some of the theories were that these male to female predominance of deaths and cases was because more men smoked in China. However, over the course of the year, we've made uh, with, with additional studies, additional countries, larger populations, we've noticed some changes in those demographic numbers associated with COVID. What we now see is that the cases of COVID 
are essentially equal between men and women. That men and women are infected at approximately the same rate. However, for every 10 women, only 8 men get tested. For every 10 women who are hospitalized, 11 men are hospitalized. For every 10 females that are entered into the ICU, 18 men are admitted to the ICU. For every 10 females that die related to COVID, 13 men die. And for every 10 women that get a vaccine, only 9 men seek the same vaccination. So there's this funny dichotomy of it appears that the mortality and the severity is worse in males than it is in females. Now, why is that? There are a number of theoretical explanations. We're still in the, the mode where a lot of our information comes from observational studies, animal studies, uh, in vitro work, and we don't have a lot of, of human descriptive studies. So what I'm about to tell you, some of the discrepancies between male and female response to COVID are just that. They're theoretical at this point, and they may or may not explain the actual differences that we observe. First, there's a difference in the distribution of ACE2 receptors. Um, it, there are differences in where these receptors are, and in general, men are felt to have more ACE2 receptors than females in general. When we look at animal studies, looking at um, the, the presence of ACE2 receptors, we notice some, some discrepancies and some influence of sex hormones on the, the generation of, of ACE2 uh, receptors. If you take male rats and do an orchiectomy, uh, it reduces the ACE2 receptor quantity in, in the male rat. Correspondingly, if you take a female rat and do an ovarectomy, it increases the ACE2 receptors in the female rat. So there is some suggestion in the animal model that sex hormones have an influence on the expression of ACE2 receptors. And if that's the case, that may be one of the reasons why the, we see the difference in severity and mortality between men and women. A second reason is there appears to be some crosstalk between the TPM, TM, uh, TMPRSS2 serine receptor and androgen receptors. In fact, when you look at the, the DHT transcription, it influences the presence of that, that serine receptor. So while it's not clearly elucidated, we do know that men who um, are uh, who have prostate cancer seem to have a lower severity, lower mortality due to COVID. And so there is this question of androgen receptor role in the transcription of DHT and how that might play a role in the COVID response. There's also a really interesting theory about nitric oxide release, which in and of itself serves as a mechanism of Im the immune system to clear pathogenic particles. And when um, nitrogen oxide increases estrogen via the estrogen receptor um, protein, and so when there's an upregulation of the, the of estrogen, you see an upregulation of, of nitric, oxi nitric oxidase and nitric oxide production in that cells, which may lead to a protective quality to the females who, who, who have that increased nitric oxide production. So those are three of the major mechanisms that we presume at this point provide some benefit to females over males. There are some others that, that there's really some question about. There's the role of the X chromosome in infections. We recognize that the X chromosome carries a lot of immunogenic genes and that that can be both a curse and a blessing in the sense that 
typically when there's a duplicative gene, there's a suppression and an inactivation of one gene allowing the normal immune response. However, when that fails and there's a hyperimmune response, that's one of the mechanisms felt to be associated with autoimmune disease, but that's that suppression and that hyper potential immune response may be one of the reasons why we see a difference in the way men and women respond. I know that the sexual dimorphism um, is falling out of favor significantly. Um, and so a lot of these things, the immune response, is, is, is a big question and we just don't quite understand. When you look at the immune response, our studies to date have shown that females demonstrate a higher and longer IgG response to a COVID infection. They seem to demonstrate a better take on the vaccine. So that would suggest that the immunological response in females is better than that of males. Now that being said, of the roughly 9,245 individuals who have reported to the CDC that they acquired a COVID infection after complete vaccination, 5,827 of them, or 63%, are female. So while on the one hand, females appear to respond better to vaccination and infection through an immunological process, there is evidence that at least in the small numbers of the studies of the CDC that they are acquiring COVID after vaccination, which I don't quite understand. Then there have been described some cardiovascular disease differences. This is strictly observational, and I, at this point I don't put a lot of stock in, in those differences that are described. So when you look at the, the mechanisms so far that appear to provide the strongest evidence of pathophysiologic difference in the way that women and men, females and males, respond to COVID, it's the ACE2 distribution, the tissues in which uh, ACE2 is found, the androgen TMPRSS2 response to androgen crosstalk, and the overall greater immune response in females greater than males. And so those three mechanisms appear to be the mechanisms that provide a significant pathophysiologic difference in the response. Now when we look at the individual response pathophysiologically, that's only one of the differences and impacts that we see. Perhaps larger than the pathophysiologic response that occurs in the individual is the social impact that we're seeing as a response to COVID today. Recently, the National Academy of Sciences produced a rather extensive document that talked about the impact of COVID on our current population of specifically women in science, technology, engineering, and medicine fields. In a recent survey, they found that 27% of women reported an increased workload or work hours, a 25% reduction in their overall productivity, a 20% uh, increase in difficulty interacting with their peers, and an 18% decrease in uh, an adverse or an 18% increase in adverse uh, effect on teaching and research. In fact, one woman uh, was quoted as saying that as a professional engineer working in academia and as a single mother of three girls, the pandemic has radically changed everything. I simply do not have the mental bandwidth to be a full-time homeschooling mom, housekeeper, instructor, researcher, and family member. Another indicated that most institutions responded well to the pandemic by offering remote work, stopping the tenure clock and allowing them to choose their method of teaching. That in and of itself poses problems in that women who are on the tenure track are all of a sudden set back a full year and whether the policies and procedures of institutions were ready for this pandemic appears not to be the case in a majority of, of cases. And in fact, many non-tenured individuals face specific challenges and negative impacts on their work because of the heavy course load and the bandwidth required to switch from in-person to online coursework. It's been speculated that we may lose an entire generation at least a year of women in academic pursuits because of COVID-19. 
Now, stereotypically, women have been asked to take on the responsibilities of caring for kids at home in addition to their work responsibilities. And when working from home and caring from home, many are finding it a challenge that's complicating their advancement. Another important factor that's been reported is an increase in intimate partner violence. When you look around the world, Chile has reported a 70% increase in reports of intimate partner violence. Argentina, a 67% increase. Globally, it's about a 36% average increase in partner violence in the three months following a lockdown. Now, in the United States, we don't have a lot of numbers yet. These studies are ongoing, but it suggests that somewhere between 10 and 27% increase in calls for domestic violence in the time after a lockdown is imposed in response to COVID. So are there sex and gender differences? Well, we can answer that, yes. We can't explain them all. We can see that there are uh, mortality and morbidity differences where men are impacted greater than, than males are impacted greater than females. However, there are pathophysiologic mechanisms that may explain the reduced severity of disease in females. But in addition to the pathophysiologic differences, there are also important social differences. And the outcome of the social differences are, may end up being the longer lasting impacts of this COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you for giving me a little bit of your time. It's been a pleasure to speak with you today. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Bye-bye.